Um, before I begin, I want to say clearly and concisely that um, everything I say here is just a product of my own opinion. I do not have a degree in speaking. Um, I, I do have a degree in sociology with a minor in communications. And communications is pretty, you know, specifically interested in how, among other things, human beings speak. It should be noted, however, that there is a pretty big difference between understanding the theory of communication and knowing how to personally deliver good arguments. It's not just a difference between theory and application, it's that they're two entirely separate things. When I was in my communication courses, I was learning about the theory of how human beings interact and communicate, how do people engage with one another, what styles of rhetoric are efficacious, but I was never taught how to make a good argument. And that sucks, because that's important. In this day and age, and if you're watching my channel, you're probably a politically interested sort. In this day and age, it's become ever more important that people be able to clearly, concisely, and effectively describe why they believe the things they believe in and why other people should share that belief. And that's my job now. It's liter this, that's literally my job now. And I'd like to think that I'm pretty decent at it. Do you want to know what I think? <clears throat> In regards to rhetoric, we're all alone, fundamentally. You, it's only you up here, you know. All of your thoughts, your private world, Everything going on in your mind, that's just you. Only you can experience that. And one of the greatest struggles of life is trying to pull together those thoughts and communicate them to other people. And it's really, really difficult for a lot of people. And by a lot of people, I mean everyone. This is like a, this is like a, one of the most fundamentally human struggles there is, really. There is nobody else inside of your mind. You have to be the translator for your own thoughts. You are the one who is responsible, entirely you, for communicating who you are and what you think to other people. And in a lot of ways, it's like, a, it's like another art form. Do any of you paint or draw? I draw, for example. Um, you can communicate through painting. I mean, that's what art is. Art's a form of communication, you know? That's one of the things people do with it. You express a feeling or, um, or an attitude through painting, and your ability to do that is limited by your artistic skill. If we go back right now and we look at some Vincent van Gogh painting or some Leonardo da Vinci painting, whatever, I, I'm not an art historian, but if we go back and we look at these, you can pull a lot from that. There are people who have dedicated their lives to understanding what these art pieces mean. Not because the people who made them are super brain geniuses who hid a, 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 a like national treasure style code in the paint strokes, but rather because you can extrapolate a lot from how a person paints and why and how that related to the context of their life. But you can only do that if they're good at painting. If they're not, it gets a lot harder. And people are a lot less interested in understanding what it is exactly that person is going on about. I can't paint, but I can speak pretty well. Do you know why I can speak pretty well? It's because I tried very, very hard to. I have autism. Uh, I was, I don't know how autism works. Was I born with it? I have no fucking idea. I got vaccinated, okay? <laughs> I, they, they got me, okay? The flu vaccine, who knows? And, um, and, and so, I, so I have autism. And for the earlier part of my life, I was really, really bad at understanding people. I was really bad at it. Like, don't get me wrong. No 12-year-old is like super emotionally intelligent, you know? All 12-year-olds struggle to get other people. But I was pretty bad at it. I was really bad at it. And I wasn't very confident either. But what I was, and this is what saved me, was a loudmouth. Always have been. Still am. Always will be. 
a loud mouth. I love talking and I love being heard too. Now I'm fortunate in a respect because my father is himself interested in public speaking. And I was able to learn a little bit from him and develop an interest. And over the course of 10 years, maybe, I went from cripplingly autistic, terminally autistic, hard time making friends, no idea how to talk to ladies, because that's who I thought I was into only back then. I was just bad at it. But then I got into public speaking. Every time I was in class, I would find the opportunity to speak to the class. If there was a portion of the book that had to be read, I would volunteer for it every time. If there was an argument to be made, I would step up. If there was a point I wanted to make, I would step up. If there was a group project, I would always volunteer to present that project to the class. And I never failed a presentation. Not just never. I never got an F. Um, because sometimes I did, because I wouldn't do the, the work, and I had no idea what I was talking about. But in terms of the presentation itself, the actual ability to present the material to other people, I was always top of the class, every single time. And it only got better with time. Eventually, people would just defer to me whenever it came to group projects. I would be the one who would speak. Everyone knew. Everyone knew. Oh, Vosh? Vosh is the one who speaks. Vosh is the one who's good at it. Vosh is the one who does it better than everyone else. Teachers would occasionally defer to me and ask me to explain course segments to the rest of the class. I volunteered for um, I volunteered for um, community instruction work with um, with uh, the local police department and was asked to give presentations on how to hypothetically address particular snafu the police might find themselves in um, following systemic. Uh, uh, racism or, 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 or misinformation. I was asked to give opinions. I would get ovations. And I'm not saying these things for like, um, for, for like accolades or whatever. And I was a nerd. The, the chat's not wrong, mind you. Um, I was a nerd, but it was something I cared about very, very deeply. I didn't care if it made me look weird being like the guy who would always, um, who would always, um, guys, when I say, when I say presenting speeches to help police address accusations of systemic discrimination, I'm talking about the police responding to other people being racist towards black people. But anyway, um, I was the guy and I, I, I'm not bragging when I say that we all have skills, you know, but that was the skill I cared about more than any other. I was also fine at League of Legends, but this was the shit I really kicked ass with. And it only got better with time. You know, when I went off to college, um, uh, people would like clap after I spoke. I didn't invite them to, they just would. Um, I'd be deferred to for lesson plans. People would ask me if I could present concepts to them. I would be asked to lead tutoring courses when I hadn't even read the book. And it wasn't because I was that smart either. I was just good at conveying information. And I got so good at it. I got so, so good at it that the autism actually kind of stopped affecting my ability to speak with other people. Because being able to understand what other people want and what other people want to talk about, this isn't some magical brain secret that only neurotypical people are capable of experiencing. It's just a skill. It's just a skill, just like any other skill. And I learned it. I learned it and it took a very long time and now I'm pretty decent at it. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And everyone, including myself, makes mistakes. But I got a lot better at it. And now, as I said, it's my job. It's my job now to make arguments. And I do a decent job. I, I fuck up. Sometimes. Absolutely. But I think, for the most part, under the circumstances in which I find myself, I do a decent job. I think that a lot of people can agree with me on that point. But in terms of... <coughs> excuse me. In terms of rhetoric, like, rhetoric can mean a thousand things. You know? Like I said earlier, rhetoric can mean, like, how do you ask Susie out to prom? Like, that's a rhetorical thing. Learning how to ask someone out to prom, that's rhetoric. So I'm not here to help you with that. And I don't typically, while streaming, um, discuss 
prom asking out strategies. But what I do is I make arguments. And I would like to discuss with you how I make those arguments. Very important to me. Very important to me. Big, big deal to me. Big. I love it. Even if I wasn't doing this, I would love it. It's very important to me. So the very first thing that I want to say is this. And this is, I think, very important. There's a question, I think, that should be on the tip of everyone's tongue here, and it's this. It's very simple. It's, how do you change a person's mind? And the answer is, well, there are two answers. The first answer is, it depends. And that's probably the most accurate answer. But the, I think, more um, pertinent answer in this case is that you don't. Do you have any idea how few people's minds I've changed directly in one-on-one -on -one conversations? Do you have any idea how difficult that is? You know, don't you? I mean, God, have you ever argued just with random people on Twitter or Facebook? Just like a random, like you see someone with a stupid opinion and you take them to task? It's, it, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. And, um... And there are reasons for that. Um, the biggest one being that, generally speaking, when you're trying to change people's minds, you're either relying on stochastic rhetoric, that is to say, you're hoping that an audience will have their minds changed, or if you're hoping to change someone's mind, it's on a topic that, um, that people are willing to have their minds changed on. Let me give you an example. If somebody came to me one-on-one -on -one and they were like, Vosh, Vosh, my, my man, Vosh, hello, let me tell you about the white ethno state. That would be um, a difficult conversation for them to, uh, to to come away from feeling as though they had changed my mind. Now, as I've said before, I'm always open to having my mind changed. That's a component of rational behavior. You should always be open to having your mind changed in the face of evidence so that you can expect your opponent to do the same and not feel as though you're only not accepting their arguments because you're categorically unwilling to have your mind changed. But I don't think I'd have my mind changed there. But if somebody, if somebody came up to me and they were like, um, Hey, Vosh, I noticed that in an earlier stream of yours, you made a comment about a, a ship traveling from, a, <clears throat> you know, from a, from a dock in Japan to America. You said it would take like uh, 8 to 12 hours. Actually, I really quickly looked up um, how uh, fast ships travel, and it would take quite a bit longer than that. We're looking at at least a, at least an eight-day voyage. So in the future, uh, like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay, all right, cool. People have different levels of attachment to different types of arguments. Um, and I think understanding the extent to which you're capable of influencing a person's opinion on an argument they hold close to their chest, that's a tough one. So I'm going to break down how you make good arguments, okay? And we're going to do it, we're going to do it how we like to do it, okay? Not through song, because I cannot sing but through art, because I can draw. And f in fact, this time I even brought my uh, graphics tablet, so I don't even need to use my fucking mouse. Beautiful. Let's do it, folks. Beautiful. Look, my friends. This work? Oh, it's been so long since I've used an actual pen. Ha ha ha! Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, just as it used to feel. Let's focus, huh? So, before you get started trying to make a decent argument, and we're going to get into the specifics soon, okay? But I think, I think it's important first to focus on some general pointers, okay? And I know, and I know a lot of you people struggle with this, okay? So we're, we're gonna focus on this real hard, okay? So, 
Important point number one. If you are trying to change a person's mind, you have to maximize every conceivable rhetorical and stylistic element possible that you believe will increase the likelihood of you changing their minds. If you are the best rhetorician in the world and you show up one day on a Fox News set wearing a tank top and shorts, it is unlikely you're going to change anybody's mind because people now have an excuse to dismiss you. No matter how beautiful your rhetoric, no matter how eloquent your arguments, you have shown up in what is effectively a fashion faux pas. And for that reason, they have now been given an easy excuse to dismiss anything you have to say. So let's focus on some baseline things, very important baseline things that you can do in all circumstances to increase the likelihood of changing people's minds. Okay, we're going to call these basic pointers. Oh God, it's been so long since I've used... Basic pointers, okay? Listen up. For one, all right? Dress correctly, okay? Now this varies a little bit depending on the circumstances that you find yourself within. If you're trying to change the mind of a friend, this probably doesn't matter as much, but you probably wouldn't wanna show up and speak to your friend about a personal disagreement while wearing a suit, would you? No, probably not. Nor would you want to go in front of a camera and speak to a journalist while looking like shit. Probably not. No. In dressing right, presenting yourself well, is a pretty fucking important first step. Okay? You know what else is really fucking important? I know this is going to trigger some of you. Eye contact. This is important even for me. Look, look at me. Ask any of my personal friends, I make unflinching, unyielding eye contact with anyone that I am speaking to. Hyena, you in chat, can you testify to this? I look directly in people's eyes the entire time, even if they look away, every single time. And the reason for this isn't just because I'm power playing them, though that is in some cases what I am doing. The reason for this is because in a, in a, in a baseline Evo psych way, looking away from people indicates discomfort and discomfort indicates weakness. And you really don't want to look weak when you're trying to make a good argument. Confidence is key. You always want to look confident because if you're not confident in your own arguments, why the fuck should anyone else be? Why, why the fuck would anyone else give a shit about what arguments you have to level at them? If you, if you are showing up looking shabby and you can barely look people in the eye, how do you get over the fundamental discomfort with eye contact? I don't know, Taryn Rich. I never experienced it. I just look people in the eye. I don't know how you get over it, but if you want to make good arguments, you should learn to get over it. Think about my stream. Normally in my stream, I'm looking at about a 45 degree angle away from the camera because I kind of like that, you know? But you know when the most impactful moments of my stream are? or at least in some circumstances, it's when I turn and look directly at the camera. Now, I'm not looking at a person. I'm looking at a camera. But when I do this, I know that I'm looking directly into the eyes of, in this case, over a thousand people. And I could do that, too, if it was all of you lining up one by one. It just does not bother me. Even if I'm all close like this. You have to learn to be confident like that. It's very important. You know what else is extremely important? Watch. Posture. Posture. This is super fucking important as well. Now, obviously, this doesn't matter as much for an online format, okay? See? I'm online. It doesn't fuck like fucking... Doesn't matter as much. It just does not matter as much right here. <clears throat> now... You know where it does matter? In person. You should always, 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 if you are speaking to someone in person, look confident. And posture is a part of confidence. Okay? Listen. 
shoulders. Listen, this is easy shit, okay? This is like, this isn't even 101. This is like cl clor course like 100 or course 99, okay? Listen, when you're stand, don't fucking, <laughs> don't fucking sit like this. Don't fucking stand like this. Chest out, shoulders back. If you're sitting in a chair, arms comfortably on the armrest. If you're going for a more comfortable pose, you can cross a leg, look forward like this. Do not lean back. You want to lean forward. Make sure you look as though you are interested in the person you are speaking to. Don't fuck. Oh yeah, well, what you fail to consider in your characterization of socialism is that in reality, there is nothing inherently authoritarian or dictatorial about it. In fact, socialism is characterized by the democratic uprising of the people to secure the workplace for their own interest. Nah, 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 dang, don't cut that shit out. Proper posture, proper eye contact, proper presentation. All right. If you're speaking to a camera, if you're speaking to an audience, or if you're speaking just directly to a friend, do not waste my fucking time worrying about your rhetorical technique when you can't manage something as basic as looking a person in the fucking eye. If you can't do that, then re rhetoric just isn't going to sit well with you, okay? But if you can do that, or if you can force yourself to learn how to do that, you can probably move forward from that position. Uh, voice inflection is also an extremely important component of not sounding like a fucking tool, okay? Now, I'm not saying you have to have some like crazy fucking Chad voice, okay? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the inflection with which you carry your voice is essential to communicating to other people your level of confidence, okay? If you're, um, well, um, socialism is actually good because... Fuck that. Don't do the rising note at the end of every sentence. It's like you're questioning everything you're saying. Fuck, fuck off with that shit. Why do people do that, okay? Look people in the eyes, dress presentably, proper posture, speak confidently. Everything here is designed to communicate presentability and confidence. That's what it all comes down to at the end of the day. This isn't even rhetoric. This is just stuff that you need. This is like the baseline. This is like the, the baseline, um, uh, uh, like the groundwork you have to do before you can even consider making a decent argument. Um, don't fucking fidget. Okay. Don't fucking Fidgeting indicates discomfort, okay? Cut it out. Fucking stop. Stop doing it. Please, stop fucking fidgeting. Now, mind you, some, like, we're all going to move around a little bit. And don't do the, don't do the thing where, uh, you know how when people get, like, high sometimes, they get really paranoid about, they don't know what to do with their arms. They just... Don't do this shit. Don't, don't do this shit. I've got a hot tip for you guys, okay? Hot tip, hot tip. If you're standing, arms go down. You can use a hand or two hands to use, if you want to play like Italian, you can use it to add inflection and emphasis to your words. I do this a lot. I use my hands to speak all the time. I do it even when I'm streaming, when there's no reason for me to do so, okay? But if you're not using your hands, just fucking get, just... Just keep... Just keep it... Just keep it simple, okay? And if you're sitting down, listen, you can lean forward a little bit. That, that, this look, you know what I mean? When you're like, uh, hunched forward like this. This is like, uh, if you don't do it too much, you can do like a little power, like little power play right here. You lean in, you want to look attentive. You want to look like you're, 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 you're interested in what the person has to say. And if you, uh, uh don't want to do that, you can just sit back or have your hands together in your lap like this. You can occasionally do stuff. You know, just fucking, you don't need to, the, here's the real problem. These things are important, and I stand by their importance, but you're, if you're in a personal position where you don't feel comfortable, like, doing this, or you, or this isn't, like, intrinsically understandable to you, then that's, then that's definitely something that you're going to have to work on before, um, before considering how to be, like, uh, 
Big fucking, big fucking rhetoric, kid, okay? These are just basic, basic points. And you, and I, and you know what? I believe in you guys. I believe in you guys. I think you can do it. These are just basic things that you need to be doing, like period, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna cordon off this section as the fucking obvious zone, all right? See, look, this is the fucking obvious zone right there. And, uh, and hopefully we don't have to worry about that much in the future, okay? Now, let's get to the real meat of the discussion. Big meat, okay? Big meat. There are three, count them, three principal components to effective rhetoric, okay? Look, I'm gonna do a big three up here, see? The first of them is context. The second of them is content. And the third of them is delivery. Now, rhetoric itself is concerned only with the last one, how you deliver what you have to say. But the first two carry pieces of information that are essential in determining how your delivery should take place. So let's go over what this means. Context. What the fuck does context mean? Well, it's harder to tell when you fucking draw it out like this. Jesus Christ. Am I drunk? So, context, in the simplest sense, means all meta information which is associated with the discussion that you are going to have, all right? What kind of audience are you going to have for whatever speaking you're going to be engaging in? What's the general setting or tone of that discussion going to be? What level of formality, for example? What level of hostility? That's a big one, too. Um, what, what are the expectations that you have coming into this? You know, are you just a, 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 are you a friend of the person? So you're just expecting a friendly conversation. Are you a, um, a, a talented interlocutor who is expected to perform well? Expectation and context have a huge impact on how you should conduct yourself. And it has a huge impact on how other people are going to view that discussion in the future. I can give you a very clean example. Watch this. Is everyone here familiar with that Louder with Crowder segment, that change my mind thing, where he got called autistic by that, um, by that uh, college student, remember? The college student was like, your dumb autistic arguments, and, and Steven Crowder got really offended over it? We all remember that, correct? Yes, I think from, uh, yes, Yusuf. Uh, he's not a king, by the way. He's a Nazbol. He's a Nazi. I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be too happy over that kid in particular. However, the fact that some of you are so keen on him indicates the point that I am trying to illustrate. That is to say, think of what he did in that discussion. For the most part, Yusuf just kind of pushed back a little bit on Crowder's arguments and then called Crowder autistic or, or, or called his arguments autistic. I forget which exactly. It doesn't really matter in the case here. Um, that's not very impressive. I mean, that's, that's really not. Steven Crowder has had media training. I mean, you know, he has, um, he's, he's, a, he's a talented and adept speaker, as anyone in his position should be. I'm not saying he's intelligent or right. I'm only saying that he's decent at delivering arguments. Yosef didn't do anything particularly impressive, but what he did do is exceed expectations. Because what is expected of a college kid arguing with Steven Crowder is that they're going to weakly assert a point before Crowder dogpiles them with dishonest talking points and they kind of limp off or get really angry and start shouting. But Yusuf was confident and insulted Crowder in a way that actually got under Crowder's skin. Not very impressive if you're somebody like Sam Cedar or Kyle Kalinske. If Sam Cedar or Kyle had come up there and that was how they performed, it would be laughable. It would be laughable. No, nobody would be, nobody would be impressed with that performance. But because it was a kid with no previous expectations, he was able to cross a lower bar. Expectation has a huge impact on the perception 
of the kind of communication that you engage in. Important to keep in mind. What about, say, tone? What's the tone of the discussion? I can give you an example of this, and I'm probably going to come back to this example soon. What about my discussion with Jesse Lee Peterson? I assume all of you, or at the very least most of you, have seen that. You've probably noticed while watching it that I didn't appear to be taking the discussion particularly seriously. Why? Because there's nothing serious about Jesse Lee Peterson. And I think I was able to walk a pretty decent line of uh, 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 um, enjoying the frivolity of the discussion without openly making fun of him or, um, or insulting the intelligence of his audience, which, believe me, I would love to do all the time. All the time. Both of them. But because the tone of the discussion was lighthearted, because Jesse Lee Peterson intrinsically degrades the sincerity and the severity of every conversation he's a part of, because his brain is made of soup, I was able to get away with a lighter tone. If I came in with a more serious tone, I might not have looked as good. I might uh, have looked like another uh, stick-up-your-ass, joyless, question-evading, uh, uh, a lefty libcuck man bun soy boy. For example, Ben Burgess, and I'm not saying that he came off looking like shit or whatever, but Ben Burgess is a philosophy doctorate. He's a professor. And he once had a discussion with Jesse Lee Peterson where he made an effort to challenge Jesse Lee Peterson on the inherent irrationality of his questions. And you know what Jesse Lee Peterson did? He just kept asking the questions. Why won't you answer? Answer the question. And Ben Burgess got mad. Of course he got mad. He took it too seriously. And that's just not what works there. It might work in another setting. If he was speaking with academics or with somebody like, for example, Ben Shapiro, who fancies himself a little more high-minded than maybe, sure, but with Jesse Lee Peterson, I would say that was a case of the tone of the argument being ill-fitted to the way in which he approached his rhetorical style. So you've got the tone of the discussion. You've got expectations coming in. You've got the level of formality for the discussion there. I don't participate in formal discourse anymore because I'm a streamer. But I used to present at academic conferences because I was a representative of clubs and stuff, because I was a, 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 a high achiever back in university. And I would present at academic conferences and make academic debate. These are very formal settings. You, you know, are expected to dress well. Um, no swearing, of, of course. You know, there's, um, there's a, a decorum that's enforced. And... I didn't enjoy these discussions anywhere near as much as I do the discussions I engage in today, because for the most part, I find formality to be a cloak you can drape over bad arguments under the guise of civility. Formality is easy. Any war criminal can look formal. Formality is inherently classist and racist because it is biased against the tendencies of the poor and of people of color. And it does nothing to reinforce the validity of any arguments. It's possible to be perfectly formal and to deliver arguments that are of Jesse Lee Peterson tier, you know? Formality is nothing. It's a spook. But it is, to many people, important. Formality, civility, whatever they like to call it. Back then... I was very civil with my discussions, because I knew that if I wasn't, I would come off brutish and boorish. So I followed the rules. Now that I don't have those rules, the degree of civility that I engage in is determined only by the decorum of the conversation, the speaker that I have to speak with. If I'm speaking with someone I respect, I engage more formally. If I'm speaking with someone I don't, I don't care. But that's a decision that I make, not a contextual extrapolation I have to make from the setting of the discussion itself. And last but not least, you have the audience. The audience is really important to consider. Now, for many of you, you probably don't have a public platform the way that I do. And you know what? Sometimes I envy you, okay? But most of the time I don't. I'm very lucky. And when I have public conversations, I recognize that people are watching. If I fuck up, I'll see clips about it in an hour on Twitter. I'll get harassed about it for a month afterwards, you know? Um, 
I recognize that if my opponent fucks up, in many cases the opposite will happen, and my fan base will jerk me raw, telling me how great I blew the fuck out somebody else. Great. I love it. I love that. I love that level of uh, accountability. Now, dealing with the expectations of an audience is, in my case, a little easy because I am looking right now at my audience speaking to me. See? It's, it's this. Now, this is only a small fraction of my audience, but I think that this group of people right here is largely representative of the attitudes of the broader group. So, for example, when I make a point and people are spamming the, um, the, the, the me with the red eyes, uh, Awakened Vosh, or whatever the fuck that emote is called, I, th I can reasonably extrapolate that the audience I have is satisfied with the point that I have made. Or if they're spamming like, like the, like a, like a Pepega or whatever, you know, I have, I have immediate live feedback to the expectations and, and feelings of my audience. Um, which makes things easier for me. But the audience right here isn't the only audience I'm contending with most of the time. You guys are the easy part. It's easy for me to come off looking good to you people, because you like me, and some of you donate to me, and you watch my content. However, a large portion of the audience that I reach out to comes in the form of secondary discourse that surrounds whatever arguments I have, what people are saying on Twitter the next day, what people are saying on Reddit the next day, what people are talking to uh, each other about in the Discord. I have less control and less understanding of this discourse because it doesn't take place directly in front of me. And very often, it's the opinion of these people that I have to consider more so than the opinion of the people who are going to be easy on me in my own chat. This gets even more complicated if I'm debating another person with a public platform, like, for example, I Hypocrite or Hunter Avalon or Blair White. Now I have not only my own audience to consider, I also have the audience of another person that I'm going to expect will be incredibly hostile to me, uh, particularly given the way I conduct myself during disagreements. You have to keep in mind these four things. The tone, the formality, the audience, and the expectation. This is incredibly important. Now, mind you, for, for most of you, discourse is going to take place in ways where all of these are comparatively minor considerations. If you're just arguing on Twitter or like with a friend, audience doesn't matter. Expectation matters almost not at all. Um, formality doesn't matter even slightly, and the tone is only determined by the behavior of the person that you're speaking with. There's no broader expectation of how you should conduct yourself. That's easy stuff. And the consideration you have to go through, the, the context you have to understand, is lessened significantly if you are just having a conversation with some person. Let's follow through on what I've said so far, okay? Now, I didn't write any of that down because I was busy talking, okay? But on a basic level, you want to engage in behavior that makes you presentable and confident, okay? Easy peasy? Easy peasy. And before you engage in any conversation, you want to be familiar with the context surrounding that conversation. That's extremely important. Extremely important. I already gave you an example of Ben Burgess conducting himself poorly um, uh, because he failed to take into account the context of the situation, the expected tone and formality of the discussion that he was going to have with Jesse Lee Peterson. You know another excellent example of someone failing to take into account the context of their discussion? Ben Shapiro. When Ben Shapiro had his disastrous interview on BBC with, what was his name, Andrew... Andrew Neal? Andy Neal? They're British. They're all the same. I know you guys know the name. Um, when he had that disastrous interview, that horrible interview, and Andrew Neal? Andrew Neal. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when he had that horrible interview, and I, yeah, and please, yes, Pepe laugh, because that was so bad. That was so bad. That wasn't just regular fuck up. That was really bad. Um, and um, when he had that interview, not only did he not know who he was going to be speaking to, which is unquestionably a component of the context, he didn't know Andrew Neal was a conservative, but secondly, and perhaps more importantly, he didn't seem prepared to have a discussion or defend anything he said or wrote in that book. 
He came there looking for a puff piece or a little bit of media congratulations for his book. And what he got instead was somebody asking him pointed questions. And he wasn't ready for that. And the reason why that's so bad is because the tone of the discussion that he ended up having was wildly different from the one he um, expected to have. And that dissonance ended, um, uh, ended up uh, 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 causing him to gaff so hard that people are going to be making fun of him for it for the rest of his career. The rest of his career. For as long as Ben Shapiro is alive, there will be people reminding Ben Shapiro of his performance with Andrew Neal, such as the curse of being a large public figure, right? I mean, warranted in this case, but still. Once you have the context down, if you can get the context down, and that's not always easy, you have content. Uh. <laughs> now that's what you would call good rhetoric, you see. That's high quality rhetoric. Well done. An argument effectively delivered, White Nervosa. <laughs> <laughs> After you understand the context of the discussion, you have to go into the content. Again, this is still meta-knowledge. This isn't actual rhetoric. This is something that goes into rhetoric, okay? What does the content of the discussion mean? Well, essentially, it means what are you going to discuss? Like, what are you, like, what are you actually going to be talking about? This is really fucking important for understanding how to engage in proper rhetoric. Let me give you an example. In my discussion with Jesse Lee Peterson, the man, the myth, the legend, he did at one point bring up um, uh, uh, trans athletes, trans athletes. And um, this is a, this is a really, really difficult discussion to have. Now, you guys know my position on this. Trans rights, blah, blah. Trans women should be able to participate in sports alongside cisgender women. You know my position on this. However, there are three pieces of information that need to be taken into consideration here. For one, the science on trans athleticism is complicated. You need to be very, very familiar with biology, endocrinology, sports science, and a bunch of other fields to be even begin to make educated, um, informed discussions or have an educated, informed discussions on the on the capacity for trans women to participate fairly alongside cis women. That's a complicated discussion. It is not intuitively easy to understand. To the average person, uh, the idea of a trans woman participating with cis women in sports is laughably unfair. And while they're wrong in many cases, that doesn't change the fact that it takes a lot of unintuitive knowledge for a person to understand why that is not the case. Secondly, the science on this is not settled. It's, it's not. It's not settled. On the trans athlete thing, this is a very new discussion to be having. It's just not settled. I don't even feel comfortable making definitive statements on it. My broad statement has always been, I feel as though trans women should be required to be on um, feminizing hormones for a given length of time until it can be reasonably assured that their athletic capabilities are within uh, a reasonable distance of the average athletic capabilities of a, of a, of a, of a athletic cis woman, you know? But, but I wouldn't make any hard or fast statements about this. Like, it's tough. It's, it's genuinely a, a, a difficult discussion that involves a lot of really interesting scientific questions that people don't always have the answers to. And three, having a discussion that is unintuitive, 
highly technical and not completely scientifically backed with people who are at JLP's level of propagandizing dipshittery usually is going to bring about bad outcomes. If JLP asked me, well, how do you think the men who think they're women can be doing sports? They got big muscles and stuff. And then I'll be like, hmm, well, Jesse Lee Peterson, that's where you're wrong, I say to Jesse Lee Peterson. Actually, endocrinologists have found that HRT has impact on the body, which reduces the bone density. To well, actually, hold on. We need to discuss bone density. We need to discuss lung capacity. We need to discuss, like, you, you, you're like, fuck. Like, this isn't a discussion that I can have with a person like this. So I don't want to have a discussion with a person like that. I don't want to have that discussion with that person. So you know what I did? I didn't. I was... I just said, hey, you know what? It's extremely complicated. I think that there should be a few years they should be on HRT beforehand. I made a joke about how you can yeet the muscle away if you take HRT, and I deliberately made an effort to steer the conversation around that subject. And I did it pretty well, too. And the reason for that is because unless he's going to let me speak for 20 minutes in the science behind it, which he won't, there's no way for me to come off looking good there. To, to, uh, to his audience, to his audience of conservatives. So I simply don't. Choosing the discussions that you are going to have with people is unbelievably, overwhelmingly important because different discussions will, um, to different audiences, reverberate to different extents. If I was, for example, hmm, for example, if I was asked to give a presentation um, in a public setting, like say, for example, at a rally of some kind, maybe I'm invited to go to some BLM rally. I don't know why I'm a white boy. What's a, what's a rally? I don't know. A fucking some climate change rally, some protest. I have no idea. You know, if I was given the opportunity to do that and I wanted to talk about socialism, I would not go on up there and start talking about dictatorship of the proletariat and the the and 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 surplus labor and a wage extraction and and all these other high level big academic falutin marxist terms i would probably focus my discussion to extremely basic concerns that even liberals can identify with. Bernie Sanders does this really well. I do think Bernie Sanders goes crypto a lot. I do think he actually is a socialist, though his policies won't be, because if they were, he'd already have been, uh, he would have already been, you know, epstein by now. But, um, but I am, um, but, but, but I am, I am very, I'm very cautious when making points that I don't think are capable of reverberating in the contexts in which they are delivered. I'm, I'm very cautious about that. Everything has an audience, everything is a place, everything is a setting, but very often people go way too far with topics that aren't going to reverberate with the audience in which they're delivering them. A good example of this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, is um, who here knows Hassan Piker, the legendary um, Instagram himbo thought who um, hits, hits up Twitch these days? Hassan, for a while, had kind of a bad reputation in a podcast um, on Twitch called the uh, Scuffed Podcast. And the reason for this is because um, Hassan Piker would often take a very long time to make points that were at best tangential to the topic at hand. Like they would be like, people would be talking about like booby streamers on Twitch, you know, in the podcast, it was a very, it's a very irreverent podcast. And Hassan would like go on a diatribe about how it relates to this or that. And he would go off into these, these concepts that just most people just do not relate to. And he wasn't able to deliver it in language that would have appealed to them. Now, if he had had better rhetoric, he might have made it more appealing to them. However, I feel as though his decision to veer into those topics as often as he does is also itself a problem, a problem that no good rhetoric can fix. Um, you understand what I'm saying, uh, uh, chat, right? You guys have seen Hassan do that, correct? I'm not trying to dump on Hassan. You know, I think that he does good work for the most part, but that's something that I noticed. And it's frustrating to me because picking your battles is a really important part of coming off looking good. Now, 
What a Weasley little liar. Do yeah, yeah, good memes. Good, it's good memes. It's good memes. But now we get... Now we get to my favorite part, folks. Now we deliver on the stream title. Because delivery, delivering your actual points, is what rhetoric means. A good rhetorician can compensate for this, if possible. It's always better to take these in consideration, but a good rhetorician can compensate for a lack of understanding or a lack of familiarity with these two subjects. A good rhetorician can do anything. Good rhetoricians rule the world. So, let's get into it. How the fuck do you make an argument? How do you actually, on the ground, make an argument? Well, the first thing you have to take into consideration, and this is the most important thing you need to discern, because there is... Oh, boy. Because I have seen so many people fuck this up. Is what kind of appeal you are going to be using to win people's minds over. There are three main ones as they're used today. Now, the typical dichotomy is pathos and logos. Uh, uh, feelings and logic. Do you try to win them over with data and with uh, strong intellectual cases? Or do you try to win them over with anecdotes by appealing to their heart, to their feelings? Well, this dichotomy holds true, but there's another one, and this is an important one. And it's strength. Appealing to strength. In order to get people to, to trust you enough to agree with your points, they have to like you. It's extremely important. It does not matter how right you are. If you are unlikable to a person, they will never listen to you. It will never happen. It will never happen. And in that respect, there is a, a component of, of, um, of, 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 of appeal to emotion in essentially every argument. If you come off correct, but come off also like an autistically unlikable douchebag or whatever, I'm autistic, I can say it. Um, nobody is going to fucking listen to you, nobody. This isn't, we aren't in the days of the Greek Parthenon anymore, you know? There isn't, there isn't this inherent idolatry of logic and rhetoric and appeals to other people's sensibilities and faculties of reason. Nowadays, most people are busy, tired, temperamental, and stupid. And by stupid, I mean that they're not being taught properly how to reasonably engage with the subject matters at hand. And you need to style your rhetoric in a way that will appeal to these people. And I'm not just saying other people, by the way. I'm talking about you guys, too. I'd be willing to bet a lot of you are pretty fucking morally lucky. In the sense that a lot of you do a really bad job reasoning out your positions, but through luck you have arrived at leftism and progressivism, the most philosophically justifiable positions currently available. I'm, I'm, I'm roping you guys in there, too, okay? I'm willing to bet a lot of you are fucking stupid as hell. But that's okay, you know what? We can all we can all find camaraderie in our shared dumb fuckery. How are you going to appeal to people? How are you going to appeal to people? Logic, emotion, strength. When do you do it with logic? Well, if I was having a discussion in an academic setting or with somebody who is, for the most part, acting in good faith, that's something I would try to do with logic. For example, with destiny. I know, I know, I know, destiny, whatever. But if you actually look over how destiny conducts himself in his arguments, for the most part, pretty good faith, pretty high level of intellectual rigor. He's an intelligent person. He conducts his debates well. Is he right all the time? Of course not. He's a liberal. However, in a broad sense, I think that he has the tools necessary to have good, high-level discussion. And if I was trying to speak to Destiny, I wouldn't try to do this bombastic, over-the-top emotional appeal. I wouldn't, if I was talking to Destiny, uh, trying to discuss, say, for example, capitalism versus socialism, I would not be strutting back and forth, and how can you claim to care about the common man, Destiny, when you know for a fact 
that there are more empty houses than there are homeless people in this in this country by a factor of 13. How can you po- And this grandiose, bombastic, blah, 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 blah. I would not, I would not attempt to do this with him. It would be grandstanding. It would be emotionally manipulative. He would see through it. And because his audience knows how he is, his audience would see through it too. Stupid, bad, not a good way to appeal. But if I come in there with data, if I make compelling arguments, if I fucking jerk myself off and actually bother to write down an argument logic tree where we go point by point and make counter arguments and see, make sure nobody can slip away, make sure everything is as rigorous and good faith as possible. Um, I, I think that I think that would be the most effective way to have that discussion. Destiny's entire career since 2016 has been built on crushing people who make emotional appeals. Um, rather than logical ones. Logical appeals in a rigorous setting will always, always, always win out. 100% of the time. Every time. No matter what. The problem is, there aren't very many rigorous good faith settings out there. There aren't very many places where you can engage in that kind of discourse. So, in other cases, emotional appeal can be very helpful. This is usually the kind of heartstring tugging shit you want to see on the news, okay? Here's an example. If you're trying to get gun control passed, okay? Like I for, for like for example, I love guns, okay? I've I have guns, I love guns, all right? I have them under inside of my pillowcase, tucked tucked right now into my pants. I love guns, okay? I love them. I love them. But let's say you wanted to ban guns. How would you go about doing that? If you went on national TV in like a little suit, you know, and you went up there and you had your little papers in front of you and you were like, um, and you were like, um, well, actually, if you look at it, gun deaths have risen 42% since 1964. And additionally, uh, as you can see, this increases the rate of suicide by blah, blah, blah. Uh, nobody cares. Nobody cares. You can look through archives of uh, logs of 24-hour news coverage interviews of people like that. Nobody cares. You know what people do care about? After there's a big public shooting, somebody going up there on the news, crying and sniffling at a press conference, talking about how their little boy Billy would have turned 11 um, uh, um, next week if he hadn't been shot by, by, by the AR-15. You know, that shit gets national headlines. Is it a good argument? No, it's a terrible argument. People die all the time. This, this is not a rational argument in the slightest, but it appeals to people. I don't believe we should lie. I think that lying is bad. Not categorically. I think that when you lie as a political agent, it poisons the well and makes it difficult to make improvements on your rhetoric and on your movement in the future. So I don't like lying and I'll never advocate for lying. And I'm serious, guys, don't lie when you're making arguments. You don't need to. We're leftists, not fascists. We don't need to lie to sell our points. Now, sometimes we tell things that aren't true, hopefully by accident, Sometimes we misrepresent information, hopefully by accident. These things happen no matter what. There's no getting around it. But deliberate lies, I would steer away from those in essentially every possible case. Now, what information you choose to present is on your own. I don't care about this lying by omission thing. If I was running for office and I was like, I want to fix capitalism, and then somebody pointed out, aren't you actually a, like a radical anarchist? I would not, I don't, I would not consider that lying. I'm telling the truth. I'm just telling parts of it that people need to hear in that moment. That's just a part of good reasoning. But direct lying? No. I'll give you a quick example of this. You know that whole joke I do with uh, political violence is wrong, always wrong, never do it, not even in Minecraft, it's immoral to hurt people thing. And it's always with a wink and a nod and everyone knows my real position. You guys know I do that, right? If somebody in a debate challenged me on that and they were like, you support political violence, you're as bad as Antifa. I wouldn't then lie to them and say, I don't support political violence. What are you talking about? No, I would be upfront. I would be forthcoming about my position because I'm willing to defend everything I believe in. You know, the joke is a joke, but it, but it remains funny to me. 
Whatever the case may be, emotional appeal can be very effective in particular circumstances. Now for the one that I do the most. Appeal to strength. I exist in a broader community that is often referred to as the Internet Blood Sports community. It's not a defined barrier, it's just a broad group of people, usually live streamers, who frequently engage in debates, and they do so in part for the love of debate and in part as political interlocutors. Um, Internet blood sports is defined typically by high levels of bad faith discussion, argumentation, um, insult flinging, and just general dishonesty. Uh, Destiny exists in this community as well. Uh, fucking a a Andy Worski was there. JF was there. The Killstream guys are over there. Mr. Mediker, I think, yeah, participates decently often. Um, uh, um, Nick Fuentes calls himself the king of blood sports, I believe. Nick the Knife Fuentes, you know? So, yeah, it's basically just shit throwing. Now, for many of these people, for many of these public figures, and for many people in general, these people don't give a single shit whether they're right or wrong. Many of them are Nazis, and again, Nazis lie constantly. Many of them are conservatives, and remember, conservatives have no morals or principles. So it's not about, you know being right. And it's also not really about making emotional appeals, because if you go on these platforms, they're very rarely making compelling cases about how little Susie could have gotten a, a, a could have a, a gotten a pony for Christmas if only her father hadn't been burdened by taxes and government regulation. It's usually about strength. It's usually about the ability to make arguments quickly, to insult people, to come off strong, to intellectually dominate. That's what these discussions are usually about. It's about seeing, it's like a uh, Robo Warriors. What was that old, uh, what was that old game show where the teams would build like little robots that, and they would fight in like a ring that had little pits and hazards and stuff? You know what I mean? What was the name of that show? You know what I'm talking about, right? Robot Wars, BattleBots, Ro BattleBots and Robot Wars, okay? We'll just assume there's two similar shows, okay? Um, that's what these, that's what we are to a lot of people. That's what I am to a lot of you. I'm a BattleBot. I'm a, a person and you look up to me to some extent and you think like, wow, Vosh sure can't kick anyone else's ass. Uh, I'd love to see him do that. And then, and like we, cl I clash with other people and you want to see me win. You want to see me be stronger. It's not about being right or wrong, though in my case, because I care about honesty, being correct is a component of my winning. But it's like, a, I'm like a Pokemon, you know? And a lot of other people are treated like this as well. And I see you people on Twitter adding me all the time. Uh, if you you add everyone, ah, Vosh could kick your ass. Urgh, Vosh, you could, could fucking destroy you. Urgh, you would lose a debate to Vosh. I see, I see you people doing this. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with doing that, mind you. I also like internet blood sports. But the fact that I am in that position affects my rhetoric. Because I know that, um, because I know that, um, uh, uh, that in large part my ability to win these discussions and win the argument is determined not so much by the logic I bring to the table, but rather the extent to which I can dominate and destroy the other person I'm talking to. Let me give you, let me give you an example. This is probably the cleanest example. I think it was clipped by Sofane on Twitter. Here we go. This is the end of the I hypocrite debate that I had. This is a pretty easy and quick example of what I'm referring to. I think most of you will remember this. Documents. The moment that data seems to turn against you, you'll drop it like a hot iron and start running back to the memes. You're going to run back to your Twitter followers and cradle your fucking thumb after this and complain about how I did this or that, or maybe you'll comb over the VOD and find one thing I said that in certain contexts sounds a little dumb and you'll make fun of that. But at the end of the day, and I really hope you internalize this, you got blown the fuck out. And it's not because your points are bad. It's because your points are bad and you're stupid. You're fat. And that, and that was the only thing I needed to do to win the discussion. 
The rest of the discussion honestly was irrelevant. In the context of that, that was basically all that was needed. And the reason why is because as the discussion went on and on, he got more and more demoralized. I, I, I know, I know, I lost because he said I'm fat. I know, I know. But as the discussion went on, he got more demoralized. He got less willing to make insults. And I got more confident as I realized that he was backing off every single point. And I got more willing to make insults. And at the end, I capitalized on that dissonance by insulting him. And you know what he did? After that discussion, after that little thing, he did exactly what I said he was going to do. To this day, two or three months later, I hypocrite is still tweeting about me. He made an entire video like seething after our debate being like, well, Vosh was wrong in this specific way. Here's one study that counteracts the plurality of data he presented me. He, he did the exact thing. He went and suckled his thumb and went back to his Twitter followers to pick over the discussion and find nitpicks that he could complain about. I was right on every single point. And it feels good, and I love it. I love I love jerking myself off thinking about how easy it was to intellectually dominate like a like a, a seventy fucking IQ neo Nazi. But I think that what's more important about this is the degree to which it emphasizes how important strength is in coming off. Uh, uh, as a victor in these discussions. It's overwhelmingly important. Overwhelmingly important. And when I say strength, by the way, I mean a broad plurality of, of social and, and, and rhetorical characteristics that overwhelm your opponent. This can mean intellectually dominating them, or appearing to. This can mean insulting them better than that. This can mean they start crying and you don't. This can mean um, you're just more aggressive than they are. There are so many factors that can play into it. And understanding when to pull off and when to go in can be really, really difficult. Even to someone who knows a lot about rhetoric. And sometimes it's pretty easy to fuck up. Those are the three things that you need to take into consideration. Appealing to people's intellect. Appealing to people's emotions and appealing to people's love of strength, which in many cases is in itself a form of personal weakness. Has anyone started crying when you debated them? Only all of my girlfriends, Lynn. Now, starting with this, with these three basic appeals, we have to think, how do you actually make these arguments? I mean, let's set everything else off the table, for example. Um, let's assume you have the data necessary, because that's not rhetoric, again, that's preparation. Let's assume you know what you're getting into, what the context of the discussion will be, so on and so forth. You have all the information, you're prepared. How do you deliver that information? Well, the way I like to think about it is, for a debate, every single um, every single um, discussion that you have takes place on a variety of spectrums. It's kind of like the uh, the eight values test. You know, we've all seen that the the eight the eight values test. See, it's like it's like this. You know. Also, this is a discuss this is a disgusting answer, but but uh, or, or set of results, but it goes like this kind of. So we can we can start with one, okay? I think I'm actually better at writing out with the mouse than I am with the fucking, uh, <laughs> uh, with the, um, with the tablet, you know? Civility. We can do a few more. There are so many of them. You have four... Malady. There we go. You have, uh, ooh, severity. That's an important one, too. Let's focus on these three at first, and we'll do this really quickly, and then we're breaking into fucking examples, okay? Okay. 
All discussions exist on a continuum. Your decision to engage in a discussion in a certain way will characterize the type of rhetoric that you engage in and the way in which it appeals to people. Civility characterizes the extent to which you are willing to give credence to your opponent and the, essentially, kindness you are willing to engage in. A very civil person, let's say over here on the on the left, will not swear, will, um, will very rarely impugn the person uh, uh, with whom you are speaking, um, it will uh, very rarely will you directly confront them uh, on a, on a mistake that they make. If you're very very civil, you're probably just going to focus on laying out your arguments as calmly as possible, responding to their arguments as calmly as possible, and um, and, and trying not to stir the pot. Whereas being uncivil, while not necessarily a bad thing, can go in the entire other direction. You can be rude, abrasive. You can throw insults. You can directly impugn people's arguments. If if you don't like what they have to say, you can call them stupid or a liar. There are um, places that you can find yourself in all of these. For example, I was really civil in the Jesse Lee Peterson discussion. Very civil. I never insulted him. In fact, I complimented him over and over again with the explicit purpose of making him uncomfortable, which I think I did in many cases. Whereas with farther along in the uncivil spectrum, I mean, listen to the I hypocrite debate again, right? Listen to my debate with the distributist. Holy shit. Oh man, you can go really far into the uncivil side of things. What are the benefits to both sides? Well, Typically speaking, civility plays well in a setting with a high level of formality. That's a big one. Civility tends to appeal to older crowds. That's also a big one. Civility will also tend to appeal if you're speaking to people who are also civil. If you're uncivil and you're talking to a civil person, you kind of come off looking like a massive fucking cunt. Uncivility works well great in the um, works in the uh, the blood sports circuit online. Uncivility works phenomenally if you're talking to people who are themselves uncivil. And uncivility works phenomenally additionally if you are speaking to people um, that the audience will generally agree does not deserve civility. So if I was talking with a neo-Nazi here on my stream, I can say literally whatever I want to this person. They're trash to me. But if I was talking to a neo-Nazi on, say, Fox News, where... <laughs> As we all know, all Republicans are neo-Nazis. <laughs> Um, then I would probably have to conduct myself more civilly because I can't rely on the audience's expectations of my innate validity. Formality and civility are tied pretty heavily together, but it's possible for this not to be the case. For example, Ben Shapiro in his discussion with Andrew Neal was very formal, but not particularly civil. Ben Shapiro didn't swear. Ben Shapiro came wearing a suit. He spoke in um, he spoke in, in comparatively formal English. He didn't use slang. He sp looked at the camera. He looked like a um, he looked pretty well like any other um, dignified guest that you would see in a. Um, uh, 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 at a BBC news slot. However, he was comparatively uncivil, directly calling uh, uh, Andrew Neil a hack and like a liberal shill and what have you. So formality and civility do not necessarily correlate 100% of the time, but in all likelihood, there is, uh, there is a relationship between them. On the other hand, remember what I said earlier, formality is tied heavily to classist and racist um, expectations for how people behave. So being poor and being particularly black make you less formal intrinsically just by by way of cultural inclination or dialect so it is possible for let me think for an example um for like a poor black dude okay imagine a poor black man in your mind okay i don't know imagine like worn jeans white tank top um he's got like a, a do-rag and he's not very wealthy so this, so if this person walked onto the set of a, um, walked onto the set of like a, um, uh, a news station, they would look incredibly unformal. They would look, they would break the fucking scale, you know, because they look like a poor black person. However, it's possible for such a person to be incredibly fucking civil. I mean, haven't you all met people like that? Have you not met people who looked poor or looked I mean, just using the terms people use, ratchet or ghetto, but then in actually speaking to them, they were incredibly kind and reasonable people. I'm sure you've seen this, yes? I mean, I certainly have. These are examples of how people can defy the correlation between civility and formality. And it's important to make sure you don't 
um, overlap like or correlate these two because it's possible to break audience expectation by being one by but not the other. So, um, for example, if I went on Fox News, I'm just thinking I'm just thinking like generic like big news station with a lot of boomers watching. If I went on there, you know. Formality is a given, absolutely, and civility is expected, but if I break line and act a little uncivil, directly challenging whoever I'm speaking to, even though I'm maintaining that formality, I can come off looking really good. Point in question. Remember that leaked audio from Tucker Carlson's unaired discussion with that one professor when that guy called Tucker Carlson a phony and a faker for not actually standing up for the working man? Do you remember how when that man was speaking, even though he came off perfectly formal, kind, um, reasonable, well-spoken, uh, good diction, he, um, he nonetheless broke civility by directly uh, uh, impugning his host? And it came off looking really fucking good, didn't it? It came off looking really fucking good, did it not? Goddamn right it did. Now, severity is something that I think a lot of people overlook when they're talking about the extent to which you can affect others' opinions. Hold on, hold on. Severity is a very big one. To be unsevere is to be kind, generous, frivolous, and sort of lighthearted. And to be severe is to be deadly serious. Greta Thunberg's famous UN speech is extremely severe. Um, it not only does it directly impugn, you know, people and their attitudes and what have you, but this is, I mean, I think like you'd be ridiculous, it'd be ridiculous of you not to characterize the context of the discussion as being severe. It absolutely unquestionably is. Um, the Jesse Lee Peterson discussion that I had wasn't even remotely severe, even though we were talking about comparatively huge issues like fascism, um, discrimination, racially, uh, uh, white nationalism, Nazis, that Nazis, that sort of thing. Uh, Hispanics, Mexicans, you know, even though we were talking about stuff like that, big issues like lesbians, this was still a very frivolous conversation. If I wanted to, I could probably pull out 20 lines like this, where I discuss where you fit on an axis of a particular aspect of how you communicate with other people. But at the end of the day, I don't feel as though that's an effective way at teaching rhetorical style, because rhetoric is extremely complicated and very, very particular. I could spend a very long time going over it, but at the end of the day, all you would have is some abstract understanding of a bunch of weird charts for being like, oh God, I'm speaking to someone. Oh God, do I tone the civility up or down? Ah, fuck, like what do you do, right? So we're going to do something I'm sure all of you are going to be delighted by. We are actually going to take a moment to look at the conversation I had with Jesse Lee Peterson. I'm going to skip around a little bit and I'm going to explain in depth why I did what I did, how I handled it, and why I responded in the way that I did. I feel as though this is an excellent example of rhetorical strategy because Jesse Lee Peterson is an abhorrent and disgusting human being, but his tone is so off-putting, his, his frivolity is so all-encompassing that it can often be difficult to engage with him uh, with and, and look good to an audience. So mm -hmm. There we go. State. I think actually. There we go. Oh, this is on the fallenstate.tv. Look at that. This is like the. Don't mind me. I'm gonna need this space. Yep. Could you go over how you planned and prepared for talking with JLP? 21st century socialist, I never plan or prepare any of my debates with people. I feel as though it throws me off. 
Yeah, all I, all I knew about JLP is the video that I had seen from him and Destiny. And that's it. That's literally all that I knew. Join me, folks. Let's go over it a little. Shut up. I did plan the outfit. Not this again. Welcome to the Fall Estate. I am Jessica Kareem Mabel. Very Mamma Mia, hola, season your interesting person today. I have with me Bosch. So, first point, first point here. Let's go on to the, the, the very, very basic, the very beginning. So, remember what I said at the very beginning? Eye contact clothing, okay? I can't help the fact that I'm fat that much, and I'm sticking with the man bun, so we're going to keep with that, okay? However, I came dressed not formally, but competently. I have a jacket on, for example. I also chose to wear red and black because red and black is typically associated with the um, uh, with the colors of like the anarchist or libertarian socialist flags, the rose. And I wore a fucking garish, ugly American flag t-shirt because one of the easiest ways to disarm a conservative is to... Um, is to um, appeal to like phony patriotism the same way that they do. So that was my, that was the reason why I dressed the way that I did. So I'm going to go over this. As you can see, I'm leaning forward. I am leaning forward for the majority of this discussion. Um, I always keep eye contact with him uh, unless I break eye contact to look for a moment at like the, the water at the desk. And Bosch is a socialist. Oh yeah. YouTuber streamer who focuses on political activism and uh, his YouTube channel is called Bosch. Welcome, man. It is a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so my goal here, and notice the difference in our um, notice the difference in our postures. These were not particularly comfortable chairs. I will admit they were a little bit big for my taste. Look at how small JLP looks in this chair. Like he's actually smaller than the chair, and I'm only a little bit larger than it. It wasn't comfortable to lean back on because I felt like I was falling into the back cushion. But when I lean forward, you know, like I have to keep an arm propped on my knee, or else I look kind of awkward and, and janky. So. I feel like, I don't know, like if this is like a secret nasty chair designed to unnerve the guest. However, my goal going into this discussion was to come off as a fun, lighthearted leftist, you see, because I have seen in the past examples of other left-leaning people discussing stuff with JLP, and they usually take one of two routes. They either come in here and try to outbrain JLP, which is impossible. JLP is the smartest man alive. Or they come here and they get really fucking mad at JLP, really fucking mad, and just start insulting him or they walk off set. And that seems to happen basically every single time. Destiny, actually... I have with me. And this is Destiny's discussion. Holy shit, 710,000 views? Fuck me. Studio. Destiny. Man, in your opinion. Well, I'm curious what a man is to you. I'll tell you that in a minute, but tell me, since you're my guest, what is a man? What is a man? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, people that have values of, I guess, honor or integrity or chivalry, people that stand up for what they believe in than the people inside of it, no? Amazing. And so you're not for the wall going up, right? No, not really. Are you for the wall going up in Israel? Israel has a wall. Are you for that? That's a neo-Nazi talking point, by the way. You're against the wall? Oh, I bet you're in favor of Israel's walls. God, he's so fucking obvious. Anyway, apart from the fact that uh, Destiny is a, uh, a beta male, um, the, another problem I think he had here is that while Destiny obviously came off more intelligent than JLP, I, I mean, duh. Um, I, I, I mean, yeah. Um, another issue here is that Destiny didn't come off particularly likable. Now to, now to us, now to, to us, to us lefty audience members, Destiny comes off looking like the befuddled intellectual trying to wrap his head around JLP's incredible brainlit shit, you know? To us, he looks good. And I like this interview very much, at least from Destiny's perspective. But to an audience of conservatives and people who watch JLP for the memes but don't like leftists, 
I don't think Destiny did an especially good job of coming off in a way that makes him likable. And remember, likability is a key component to getting other people to accept your positions. Now, the, di the difference between our approaches here is actually categorical. Destiny does not care about changing people's minds. He said this many times. He doesn't care about, um, he doesn't care about like making a case. He only wants to see good arguments. He just likes making correct arguments. So he's probably not going to put the effort in to manipulate the opinion of the audience in the same way that I would, which is why in this interview, I am performatively disarmingly nice to JLP at every point, why I wear the stupid American flag t-shirt, and moreover, <laughs> and moreover, um, why I, um, I make a deliberate effort to keep the tone of the conversation jovial and light. Thank Happy you. to meet you. Yeah, same here. Thank you for coming. Um, so one day you were walking down the road and decided that you want to become a YouTuber? Oh. Honestly, I've idealized the lifestyle long as YouTube has been around. Love. By the way, I also engage in a lot of folksy aphorisms that I would never engage in in my day-to-day -day life. Listen to how I phrase this. Tuber? Oh. Honestly, I've idealized the lifestyle long as YouTube has been around. Love yeah. the idea of being able to just get your thoughts out there immediately. Yeah. On that day, tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people listening that day. Feels fantastic. I would like a... Uh, couldn't ask for anything more. I would never speak like that in other contexts. That's a folksy aphorism that I would never do if I was just speaking to friends or speaking to my stream. But if I'm uh, if I'm talking to an audience of people who assumes that all leftists are like bad about like soy boys, then me doing the knee slapping, me doing the the deep voice like aphorisms, me being friendly and jovial, all of those things go a huge way towards um towards affecting the expectations of the audience. Vosh, were you nervous? No, I don't get nervous talking to people. Are you surprised that it took off the way it did? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I got like really lucky with, with, how, with how quickly things spiked. I don't know if that'll go on forever, but right, for now course. I'm very fortunate. And what made you think you had something to say? Um, you know, uh, I think you've actually had him on this program before, Destiny. <laughs> Let's go forward. And kill us. I think that by helping them, we can Radical Islam, serious problem. Here we go. This is a really good example of what I'm talking about. I've had Muslim they friends. cut your neck and show it on TV. Uh, I've never been around a Muslim on top of a roof before, but you know, maybe <laughs> if. I think, uh, I mean, we, we if don't you- don't go over that country. So here's- Parents know you are like this? So here's a really, really big one, okay? So this is after I have explained that I am not straight to Jesse Lee Peterson. So he's now going to do one of the classic, um, the, the classic like uh, uh, conservative talking points, which is, oh, you gay? Well then why you like Islam? You know, they throw you off buildings. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's this is very common. I see this online all the time. Familiarity with generic conservative talking points goes a really long way towards prepping you to respond to them quickly. Oh yeah, they're super nice. Your father's okay with it and he's aware that Islam. Oh, well, I'm not a big fan of religion in general, so eh, not too much in that, but I think pretty much like Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, you know, it's in that ballpark. He asks me how I feel about Islam. So I don't like Islam. I don't like any religion, which is why I make sure to frame my answer with two simultaneous goals. One, to respond to it, because if you don't directly answer a JLP question, he'll just ask it again, which makes you look bad, because it makes it look like he's the one cutting through your bullshit. You don't want him to do that to you. And B, indicating that my dislike for Islam is comparable to my dislike for basically all other religions. So in that way, I respond to the question while, um, while, while prepping my position for the follow-up question, which I already know is going to be about me being gay or whatever, because he mentioned Islam immediately after talking about my sexuality. I already know where this is going. Do you know that they'll throw you off a bridge if they found out that you are homosexual? Really? I've they'll had Muslim friends? They'll throw you friends? off the top of a building. I've had Muslim they friends. They cut your neck and show it on TV. Oh, I've never been around a Muslim on top of a roof before. So at this point, by the way, guys, is this boring? I feel like this point by point analysis is actually an extremely helpful way of breaking down like how rhetorically I process the information I'm going through. So 
there is no denying that in most parts of the world, um, Islamic uh, 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 societies are, are tend to be pretty um, homophobic. There's no getting around that. Now, of course, this is the case for many non-Islamic societies as well, including places like, you know, fucking Russia and fucking China. So it's, it's not as though this is uh, unique to Islam or anything like that. And additionally, um, you know, whether you like it or not, anti-LGBT values are pretty fundamentally baked into how most Americans understand Islam. So here are my, so I have positions that I can take right now. Here are the positions that I can take. I can choose to argue the point completely and say that Islam is not inherently more homophobic or whatever than other societies, which is not intuitively correct to the people who are listening. That's very important. When you're trying to appeal to an audience, you want to make points that they can't dismiss offhand. If I responded with, you know, um, Islam isn't like any more homophobic than like any other place or whatever, they would like, they would just be like, ah, fucking Lipcuck defending Islam yet again. You know, crazy fucking LGBT, a pathological kindness, letting these barbarous monsters into our country to destroy all the gays, so on and so forth. I know how that plays with the response. So I could do that. Or I could try to jovially misdirect the conversation and make it a, um, and make it about, um, uh, um, like other, like just general problems LGBT people face by coming off as frivolous, by not engaging with the topic with a great degree of severity. It makes it a lot easier for me to ply over a conversation that otherwise would take a degree in history and like uh, 80 minutes to explain properly to the audience, which I'm not going to get. So I'm going to take the answer that leaves me with the best outcome in the shortest length of time. But, you know, maybe <laughs> if. I think, uh, I mean, well, if don't you... go over in that country. Oh, no. I mean, I love it. I mean, you can see I ain't yeah. leaving this place. But See, an appeal to how much I love America. But, yeah, I mean, you know, if you go back just a couple years or it really, if you just go into some parts of the South, plenty of mean things Christians do into gays, too. So Like what? Oh, um, well, there's the conversion camps. That's a big one. That's, that's not mean. That's love. Uh, I mean, some would say, I mean, Muslims would, would say that Would you rather have your hair cut off or... or uh, the help, uh, someone gave you help to overcome that. What would you prefer? So he's asking me a direct question here. He's asking me, would, um, essentially, would I rather have my head cut off or would I be, rather be put in a gay conversion camp? Now, again, I can spend five minutes arguing about how gay conversion camps are horrible and have been determined to be ineffective and unethical and how they are condemned by basically every ethical and psychiatric association. I could do that, or I could not waste my time with a discussion point that he will steer away from 12 seconds after he notices that I'm trying to inject nuance into his stupid false dichotomy. So again, uh, helped overcome like my hair. Or to get your hair cut off by oh. an Islam person. Well, you know, when you put it that way, I think I'd prefer the camp, but I don't like either. <laughs> Are you concerned about... See, sometimes, again, in the format of this show, in the format of Jesse Lee Peterson's show, you have, you can answer yes or no questions, and if you're lucky, you get 15 seconds to extrapolate on a position of your own. If you're incredibly lucky, you get to ask a question. You do not get to inject nuance into anything that is being said. There, it is simply not possible. So I want to hit in on the conversations where I can make strong, fast, intuitively understandable points in a short length of time, and steer away from the conversational topics that are more complicated, that are not intuitively understandable, and would require more nuance to explain. Um, radical Islam? Uh, I'm concerned with how we're reacting to it as a country, what not so mean? much the Islam itself. Okay, this I'm really proud of right here. He asks me if I'm concerned with radical Islam. I mean, we all are to an extent. It is a problem. You'd have to be an idiot to not think that radical Islam isn't a problem. I mean, it is, particularly for people in the Middle East. But I succeeded here. I actually got him away from the question, and I'm very proud of this. 
Uh, I'm concerned with how we're reacting to it as a country, what not so mean? much the Islam itself. Um, See, rather than answering his question directly, because if I just said yes, it would play into the conservative hysterical fear about Islam, I got him to misdirect and ask me a question on my misdirection. The fact, if, if, if he was being uncharitable here, he could have said, I, I would have said like, um, I'm concerned with how we're reacting to it. And he would have said, answer the question, how do you feel about radical Islam? And then I would have said, well, I don't like it. He would have said, next question. But I think because I've been nice to him, because I've been civil and generally um, and generally uh, uh, pliable, you know, like fun to speak to, he's willing to give me a moment on this. I've seen him be less charitable with people in the past. That's the goal. You get the moments you can, you know? Radical Islam, serious problem. Terrorist attacks, it's bad. Like you open with something that feels intuitively correct to the audience right there. When I'm opening, I have to admit, yep, terrorism is bad. No denying it. Radical Islam's a problem. This gets people to trust me. Now the audience is thinking, okay, this isn't some crazy dishonest lefty who thinks there's no barbaric Muslim threat. Like, don't get me wrong, you know? Yeah. Um, but I worry that sometimes the reactions to those terrorist attacks can lead to much worse outcomes. So like, for example, the Patriot Act. Now notice, when I start to explain how this can lead to worse outcomes, I don't begin by talking about foreign policy, and I don't begin by talking about ICE or immigration laws, because those are all things conservatives are going to disagree with me on. I open with saying the Patriot Act, something that even conservatives have mostly turned away from today. That this was, I'm very proud of this. This was absolutely key to the perception of this point. If I had opened with, see, our reaction is bad because now we're not letting as many Muslims into the country, Jesse Lee Peterson would have stopped me and said, well, ain't that a good thing? Because they could be radical Islamists. Um, but by opening with the, with the Patriot Act, something everyone here dislikes, nobody would say they like the Patriot Act. I can, um, I can pull them in further, which is why the next things I say are more lefty or the existence of the TSA and TSA that's also kind of a middle middle ground there that's like uh most people don't like the TSA but not as much as people dislike the Patriot Act homeland security and homeland security that's a little bit further to the left most reactionaries and conservatives believe that homeland security is essential and, uh, uh, ice and ice and I end it on something that only far left people advocate for, the abolition of ICE. By ordering things in that way, I keep him from cutting me off and I get people on my side before I've concluded with the sentence and I get people to implicitly agree with the context of the sentence, even if the specific things I list, they might not agree with. I think that these are overreactions to problems that we could address better through more meaningful foreign policy. You don't, you don't believe that they are a security threat to us? Um, I, would, I, I do think they are. I mean, 9-11 happened. It'd be hard right. for me to argue against that. Mm -hmm. See, okay, that's the big one right there. Um, now, as we all know, white, white uh, supremacists are responsible for most like deaths these days in regards to, um, uh, in regards to terrorist attacks. However, everyone knows 9-11 happened. It happened. There's no getting around it. A lot of people died, okay? So when he asks me, you don't believe there's a security threat, I know what I have to acknowledge here. Because if I don't acknowledge it, and I say, well, it's mostly white supremacists these days who are causing trouble, he's then going to say, but what about 9-11? You understand? I'm I'm not trying to be um I'm not trying to be like hyper analytical like I'm I'm Yagami Laito, you know, like trying to figure everything out, but this is actually the the this is actually the the rhetorical process that I try to go through when I'm having these conversations. I try to think, what are they going to say? What can I say to beat them to it? What can I say to preempt expectation to lead them to the conclusions I want to make? These are these, this is what I'm thinking every second I'm engaging in discourse. Now, it was easier for me with Jesse Lee Peterson because Jesse Lee Peterson, and this is important, talks slowly and is very predictable, which makes it easier for me to preempt those points. But if I was talking to someone who speaks much faster or hits me with points faster, like say, for example, Ben Shapiro, I would have to be much quicker with my responses. So in this respect, he's kind of like a, like a, like a prep, you know, he's like, um, 
He's like a, a tutorial, essentially. But I think I did fairly well, given the circumstances. Let's continue for a little while, because I think this segment, I think, adequately demonstrates the, um, the, the, the way in which I approach these discussions. But I think 9-11 and a lot of those other incidents were products of our really bad foreign policy. We keep destabilizing foreign governments. If we went in there, we helped them, you know, we helped them with their economy, we invested in their industries, we stopped hating them for the, who they are. If we loved everyone like you do, I... They, I'm so fucking proud of this. This is so fucking good, okay? So right now I'm saying 9-11 didn't happen because Islamists are evil bad guys. I'm saying it happened because of our foreign policy, which most conservatives would push back on. But then I follow it and I follow it up and say, if we could love everyone like you do. Jesse Lee Peterson is always talking about how he loves all people. All people. If I hit him on that point, he has nothing to say. He has nothing that he can say in response to that. I think that we could get like way, way, way better outcomes. Should we help our enemies who will rise up against us at some point and kill us? This is a yes, no question. Should we help our enemies, but it's leading who will rise up against us and kill us? I reject the dichotomy. I think that by helping them, we keep them from rising against us. Right there. And I believe that. That's not a lie either. I believe that's the case. Much in the same way, you know, like if you if you uh, provide socioeconomic assistance to like an, un an impoverished area, that area is probably going to have less crime because, the, the, you know, you've improved the conditions there. Exact same way. Um, I reject the dichotomy. I answer, but I do it quickly because if he notices that I'm taking 10 seconds to answer his yes, no question, he's going to cut me off and ask me for it again, which is, again, bad. I don't want that to happen. I want to come off like I'm answering snappily. It not is by really. keeping them in their in their country ghettos in, in the third world. But helping them will not stop them from hating us. It's like, um, I mean, you like you're a reverend, right? Right. Yeah, you you know how transformative love can be. Okay, this is this was like this was the the fucking the death blow for for JLP's argument. He moved off this topic after this because he has nothing to say. I know I'm personally in my life, I've met people who are going through dark times, who hurt others, drug addicts, who steal to feed their addiction. And by showing them love and compassion, you bring them up to a higher place where they're no longer willing to hurt anyone. I think we can do that on a, on a civilizational level. Well, most they cut out a segment here where I continued to hammer him in on that. That cut you just saw, that, that quick cut, was, um, was, was masking like 20 seconds of me saying, Reverend, we got to show them the love, which was maybe a little bit overly performative. But that right there, he just had to change topics after that. He had nothing else to say. If you phrase arguments in a way that makes it seem as though your position is the logical conclusion of their thought process, you, you fuck them. There's nothing else they can do. It's like... um. It's like, um, uh, um, it's one of the reasons why Nazbols have gotten better at arguing lately. It's because they're able to phrase all their white nationalist talking points behind a veil of like, uh, um, like a, 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 a premise or a, a conceit of them identifying the, uh, or helping the proletariat, sorry. Um, if you, if you make arguments that align ideologically with your opponent's positions, that is, uh, th then you, then you fuck them and they can't do anything. So you don't have real love, they only have mama's love. Uh, what's mama's love? See, he completely jumps off the topic. Now we're talking about his mommy issues. Um, okay, he's going to talk about his mommy issues for a little while. So that's not really like rhetorically relevant. At this point, when we're talking about, I oh, know, actually, we can talk about this for a less serious topic. Listen. That love that you feel that makes you think you're attracted to men and anything, that emotional stuff and the way your mind works. Did I get emotion? that from my mom? Yeah. Oh, darn. Uh, I thought, I mean, I figure that the way I like men is kind of the same the way I like women so i don't know did i get like the liking women from my dad and the liking men you from like my mom? men in the same way a woman would like so he's at so these are stupid questions that mean basically nothing to me but to his audience these questions mean a lot you see jesse lee peterson fucking hates women he had a shit relationship with his mom his son is estranged from him he's been divorced several times he does not have a good perspective on women at all and many of his audience members don't either or at the very least they reverberate with some of the things that he says so when he's sharing his personal thesis that i was made gay because my mom loved me or whatever the fuck he's i still don't really know what point he's getting at when he's making these theses to dismiss them outright would only evoke 
dislike and distrust on both his part and the part of the audience. Do you think he has some kind of Oedipal thing going on? Absolutely, I do, um, in my personal opinion. But, um, but I would only invite distrust. The goal here is for me to treat this lightly. And by treat this lightly, I mean don't dig in too hard on him, but also don't take what he's saying seriously. Let him make the arguments. If I come off like I'm just enjoying, like bemused, enjoying the ravings of a lunatic, um, then, then I come off looking a lot better. You know? Oh, that women like men. Yeah. So you think some women don't like men. So though. you think well lesbians. Yeah, lesbians. They hate ones. men. Yeah. Well, some of them. No, they hate men. See, again, right here. See? His fucking weird ass problems with women. Uh, les lesbians hate men. And to which I say, I could say no, they don't, but that's not categorically true. Some of them do. It's a half truth. So instead I say, uh, some of them, which is which is the most technically accurate answer? I've met a few lesbians. Oh who no, like men. I hate men. Damn. <laughs> well, see, I just don't don't take it too seriously. This isn't something uh, you you have to know when to play heavy and fast with topics. You know, what am I going to do? Get in an argument with him on how lesbians don't hate men? Do I have any data on that? What the fuck? Like, what? I'm not going to have that argument. Like, what what would that discussion even look like? So instead, you just play. Yeah, damn. Whoa, damn. Lesbians hate men, huh? Shit. <laughs> Fuck. Well, I hope the men didn't do anything to deserve it. <laughs> they didn't. Oh. Well, they failed them in, in that they were not real men. You know, they didn't do the right thing. But but that so but the love you have, you realize that's mama love, right? Mama's hey. love operating through you. You hey, have listen. the mindset of a woman. I love my mom. She's been a wonderful force in my life. Right. If that's something I'm carrying through from her, then absolutely. Would you like to overcome her? Oh, not at all. I saw her just this morning. She helped me out, get, made breakfast for me. I'm lazy. You see, I slept in a little bit too. Folksy aphorisms. Like, <laughs> uh, she's wonderful. I couldn't, I, I could never toss away a part of her like that. Could you ever be <laughs> honest with her about herself? Um, uh, what, what about herself? You know how she is. She like controlling, she like uh impose herself on you i think my mom she my mom's not a helicopter and... parent actually she's she was very reasonable helped me with my hobbies disciplined me when i needed it let me be other times why do you so again this is another big point there's a, a common stereotype amongst conservatives is that liberals are all spoiled like mama's boys who um or, or, or like they're poorly disciplined or like they have a bad relationship with their parents or they didn't have a good relationship with their dad. So, so on and so forth, you know, all of these things are, yeah, he's projecting like crazy, but, um, but, um, all of these things are, um, all of these things are associated with how the conservative sort of imagines the liberal. So when I emphasize here that my dad and my mom both disciplined me, but also weren't helicopter parents, what I'm trying to do is navigate my way through this minefield of expectations that would allow an audience of conservatives to uniformly dismiss everything I have to say. Father do that. Um, oh, my father did it as well. They just did it in different ways, you know. Is your father beta male? Oh, my, oh no. My dad's pretty, pretty big, strong guy. Uh, entrepreneur, self-made businessman, respected in his work field. Like See, that, that right there, one hunt, that's what I'm working with right there. When I prep up my dad, I don't talk about my dad's personal talent or the fact that he's a very competent artist. I prop up the fact that my dad is a businessman, an entrepreneur, respected in his field right there. I can do that without compromising on my positions, you see, because I'm, I mean, I'm not my dad. He can do whatever the fuck he wants with his time, I suppose. Um, but I, in that way, I play to, um, whatever positive expectations conservatives might have concerning upbringing. It's a good thing to have a strong, disciplined father who's successful in regards to business. That's a good thing to them. I mean, it's a good thing. I mean, it is a good thing, you know, like it's be better than the alternative, but. Like why did he protect real. you if he's not a beta why didn't he protect you from your mother oh uh, i think that my dad's pretty happy with how i turned out actually we had a, a heart to heart talk last night he had to leave real early in the morning today and oh you uh, live with them uh, i came down i live in 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 uh, washington i came oh. down to visit them because they live in la oh before okay I'm coming over here i got you and uh yeah no i think he's pretty happy with how i am all things told what do you so we got that what do you think about the homosexuals when they compare themselves to black people <laughs> he goes off He's fucking crazy. Holy shit. I think shit. she, in addition to her being like really big on social media. That's Jessica she, Yaniv. Um, I think that both. Individually, you can work really hard, but no, as a I group, we... 
um, black uh, discrimination. Not what I'm here for. That's Do not black Congress. people have the right to complain about white people, what they have done and what they are doing? Do they have the right to complain about white people? Yeah. So this is the last thing that I'm going to say, and it takes a really long time to sort of suss through all the footage, so I'm only going to give a, a brief description of how it plays out. Um, essentially here, um, JLP begins by asking me if black people have the right to complain about white people, and then if white people have the right to complain about black people, and then if white people have the right to complain about Jews. And you can kind of see where this is going, right? If I say, yeah, white people have the right to complain about Jews, then that what he what he means by complain about, he means like Jewish question. When he says white people complain about black people, what he means is systemic discrimination and calling them low IQ monkeys, you know? That's the game he's playing. So I try to navigate my way through this for a little while, but I keep giving him, um, I keep giving him like the conditional answers, you know? I keep giving him the, you have the right to, but your 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 criticisms should be good, you know? And I have the right to complain about those criticisms. And then he's like, do you have the right to hate white people or whatever? And I say, I don't like it when people hate people. And then is it, are you a white supremacist if you complain about black people? And then I say, well, does it depends on how you complain about black people. And then he repeats the question over and over and over again. In that position, because I feel, I feel like, this would be my guess, I feel like JLP because this is near the end of the interview, taking account of what we had said in the past, recognize the fact that he wasn't getting any of these big dunks on me, any of these big yes or no, answer the question, dunks on me. Um, so he tried to push one really hard towards the end. And he did, to his credit. But I think at that point, I had cemented my competence in the eyes of the audience for the most part, which is why I was able to get away with what I started saying towards the end, which I think I'm saying here, which is why I have a stupid expression. So are white people Jewish supremacy for complaining and disagreeing with the Jews? Sometimes. Uh, no, I'm still answering seriously here. I, did, I never thought I'd hear you say faces and Show the their faces. I love Antifa. Do you love Antifa people? I love all people. I love Antifa I don't people. agree with Antifa. I think they're standing up for America. I don't America. agree with Antifa at all. I believe that it's an <laughs> evil, radical group that has been paid to do what they do. I think ignore. America is all they, about freedom they and democracy, helping. and they're fighting for that. They're out there in the streets. Are they right to fight? people in mass and high and be cowards like If those that. people are fascists, yeah, absolutely. So Antifa is a fascist group, right? No, no, right? they're fighting fascists. You're right about them. They are fascists. We're all I fascists. Did, I never thought I'd hear you say that. We're all fascists on this blessed day, Reverend. What? We're all fascists on this blessed day. What is a fascist? A uh, fascist is a very bad type of person. Do you like fascist people? I love them. Okay, so as you can see, at this point, Notice the change in my posture and poise. I'm smiling now. I'm leaning back into the chair. I have one arm over the end of the chair. The reason for this is because at this point in the discussion, it's become clear that he's not giving me questions that can even be answered anymore. So the only thing I can do is play them off in a way that looks good to an audience. At this point, we're just having fun. But just because you're having fun doesn't mean you can't try to win. At this point, it's more comedy than anything else. It was always comedy, but at this point, any facade of political commentary has more or less been dropped. The reason why I go over this, and the reason why I took so long to do the Rhetoric 101 stream, is because it's much more difficult to explain the basics of rhetoric than it is the basics of political theory. Political theory is, is, is easy. For one, you're actually taught it in school, so I remember that. And for two, it's pretty, it's easy, you know? You have the you have pre-modern ideological tendencies, divine right of kings, blah blah. Then you have the enlightenment, ideas of self-determination, democracy and laissez-faire capitalism begin to spread. We start to believe in individual human rights, inalienable rights, you know, the spreads across the world or at least in many parts of the world. And then liberalism sort of solidifies itself into sort of um a neo-colonial globalist capitalist like enabling regime and then from this you have branches of people who are discontented on one hand with the alienation um, of capitalism and on the other hand the exploitation and you can either go fascist or socialist and just a you know that's 
that's easy. I can do that in my sleep, you know? And I want to do a Politics 102 that I discuss, like, I really want to talk about all of the prevalent ideologies that exist today. You know what I mean? Like, everything you need to think about. What is fascism? Like, how can you tell? I've talked about it in the past, but it would be nice to really go over it, you know? Anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism, neoconservatism, and neoliberalism. What are all these things? How do they relate to one another? I want to do that. But the reason why I took so long with the Rhetoric 101 stream is because rhetoric is so contextual. So much of it relies on your ability to make assessments in the immediate moment of a person's character and rhetoric and then to extrapolate from it an understanding of the best way to respond. And that's, and that's very, it's a very personal process, you know? It's a very um, contextual process. Very, very contextual. So I want to say, I want to say this, and this, and this I think hits on it harder than anything else. The goal when making an argument is to have the other person like respect or trust you enough that they're willing to hear you out. If you have neither their, their appreciation, their respect, or their trust, they will never listen to you, not in a million years. So you need to earn one of those three things. You can do it by being very calm and intelligent. You can do it by being loud and bombastic and strong. You can do it by being funny. Humor goes a long, long way, you know? And that's... It can be difficult sometimes to tell what people are looking for. Um, and even if you know what they're looking for, there's no guarantee it'll work. But if you can get them to do one of those things, to like you, if you're funny, jovial, if you make the haha jokes, if you're trustworthy, if you're there for them, if you seem like you have a lot of consistency or appreciation within the field you work, or if you are strong, if you're impressive, if you're loud, bombastic, insulting, aggressive, if you toss everyone else to the side, if you blow them the fuck out, and you get their attention... You now have control, at least a little bit, over a small part of their mind. You can put a seed in their head, right? Somewhere in the back. When people change their minds, they don't do it immediately, and they don't do it in front of you. And like I said earlier in this same stream, sometimes, like, if, if someone comes up to me, Oh, Vosh, did you realize your characterization of the side effects of this particular medication is inaccurate? Okay, I, you'll, you can change my mind like that, okay? Like, just, yeah, I, don't, I don't care. Tell me what is right, and I'll look it up, and if it's right, I'll believe it. I don't care. But for larger ideological things, like, all you can really do is plant the seed. The best way to change a person's mind is to win their trust or affection or respect or attention, to give them questions they can't answer within their own system, or that they don't have good answers for, and then leave them on their own in a space where they have access to information pertaining to those questions. Like, for example, a big political discord or a YouTube channel or so on and so forth, you know? That's very important. And then, well, then it just comes down to how you actually deliver that information. And there's one last piece of advice that I would like to deliver here, um, that I would like to deliver um, before doing a, a q and I guess, with the chat or with donations. Uh, and I love you guys. Hey, thanks for donating. I'll get to you in just a second. This is the single most important point to good rhetoric. This is it. This is literally it. I'm not joking. Don't argue from your own mind. Argue from the mind of the audience. You're not there for you. You're not there for your own perspective. You're there for everybody else. When I debate, I almost dissociate from myself. I don't care about myself or what I am. What I care about is who I look like in the eyes of the people who are watching. When you're talking to someone, you have to think 
And you have to really think, and this is something you learn by being an audience member. The only reason I can do this is because I was a fan of Destiny's for 10 years, watching his debates, watching his stupid fucking StarCraft shenanigans, watching him argue and call people gooks over Battle.net. He didn't, he, got, uh, he did that once, okay? I'm not trying to smear him. I'm just trying to be hyperbolic. Um, I've been an audience member, so I know what I want to see from the person who's arguing off in the distance, off on the platform. I know what I know what I want from them. I know what points I want them to make. I can feel it. When I feel them waning in a respect, I think like, I wish they would do that, or uh, you know? It's like watching a boxing match, if you're a fan of boxing. I used to box quite a bit. When you see the person you like getting, they're on the ropes, they're getting the shit kicked out of them. And you're almost, you can like almost feel your arms moving, you know? You're like, fuck me, just do, get with the left, get the left! Because you see, you see their fucking their left arms hanging. You think that you could do it. They're fuck. They're 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 fucking the right side of their face is open. Fucking get them left left hook. You know, and you're and and you're thinking, but you're not there. You're you're not there. You're just the audience. They're the ones fighting, but you can feel it. And and it's the same thing when you're watching a debate, when you're watching videos, when you watch movies, horror movies, where you see the protagonist. They're like, uh. Oh. What, what, oh, what if we split up? We'll find the monster faster that will. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. You know, you can, you can feel it. You, you, you feel what you want to happen. And you can't change anything if you're an audience member. But if you're the one doing the thing that other people are watching, you have the power to preempt their expectations. You have the power to think, what is it people watching want to see? Do they want me to back off a little? Am I being too harsh? Do they want me to go in? How would I feel if I was watching this? How would I feel if I was participating in this? You know, as as an audience member, if I was the one thinking like, uh, go, uh, you know? Learning that is critical. That is how you engage in good rhetoric. That is the number one best way in all circumstances to do it. You just have to know what the audience wants. Or your debate opponent. But again, for the most part, debate is to convince an audience, not to convince your opponent. It's acting. Well, it's not just that. I mean, I'm sincere with everything I say and believe in. It's not acting. I don't fake anything that I do or say. But it's like... It's like, uh, it's like painting. It's like painting. It's like a painting, you know? Are you being... Are you lying if you don't use every color on the painting? Are you lying to your audience if when you paint the painting you leave different sections of it to different brush strokes if you alter the uh, the perspective if you switch things up to create a better it's not acting it's not lying it's just how you present it that's art that's the art and rhetoric is art it is an art form and by art form i distinguish it from a science in the sense that there is a highly contextual and interpretive element to it. Lying by omission? Oh, I don't think it's lying by omission at all. There's no such thing as lying by omission in a debate. Lying by omission is if you're a politician talking about your plans for a country. Lying by omission is if you're telling a partner what you did last night and you leave out some key moments. But in a debate, your only responsibility, the only responsibility you have is to make things, make things sound as good as, good as they can to deliver your argument as effectively as possible without lying. That's important. I don't know how many of you engage in or participate in debates. I imagine not many of you, like at least proportionally. Um, but keep in mind that these general tendencies also hold true when you're speaking with um, uh, uh, point to point with people directly. Um, though there is no audience, there is still the same basic underlying philosophy of winning their attention, trust, affection, whatever, uh, delivering unto them information that causes them to have questions they can't answer or can't answer adequately, and then you need to leave them in a space 
space where they can challenge those unmet expectations. That's it. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm actually going to put something up to a poll really quickly, as long as we have folks in chat. This is Rhetoric 101. I would love to talk about this more in the future. In order for me to do so, though, I need more context, which means I need examples. Would you guys be interested, and Hyena, if you could make this a poll, would you guys be interested in Rhetoric 102, whenever that may happen, be me going over a debate that either I or somebody else has had, and me going over either the problems or the successes with that particular debate? If I go with a debate that I have done, I can talk about my thought process and the way in which I sort of interpreted the situation. If I'm doing it for somebody else, I can go over um, uh, uh, the problems they had in their debate, the, the points where they, uh, they, they failed to sort of meet the, the expectations of the imagined audience.